Hello and welcome to the January 2024 Longevity Review, presented to you by the Canadian Longevity Association, a federally incorporated nonprofit whose mission is to help accelerate the introduction of effective longevity treatments and to ensure their free availability to all Canadians under the healthcare system. My name is Chris Linnell, and I am the founder and president of the association. We are a volunteer-run organization and are always looking for more help. So if you would like to assist us in achieving our goal, then please get in touch via the links below this video. In addition, you'll also find a link to the newsletter being reviewed here. This month, we will take a look at how a new senolytic method could provide a one-and-done approach, how activating the immune system can lengthen mouse lifespan, and how rapamycin can be the potential cure for male pattern baldness. In addition, since we are the Canadian Longevity Association, I've made a couple of changes to this newsletter to highlight any Canadian longevity research good enough to be included. You will find in the newly renamed highlights section a Canadian study, um, which will, will also be discussed in this review, and secondly, you will also find any other studies highlighted with a, a C-A-N in bold. That might change to a maple leaf in future, but that's what it is for the time being. Anyway, let us now continue with the actual review. So this paper sees one of the most exciting areas in cancer research, combining with one of the most exciting areas in longevity research, namely CAR T cells against senescent cells. So CAR T cell therapy, which has only been in, in use in humans since uh, 2017, involves the genetic manipulation of T cells, which are one of the main cells of the immune system to in attack uh, infections, being genetically modified so that instead of going after pathogens, they will go and um, attack uh, cancerous cells, basically based on uh, markers on the surface of the uh, cancerous cells. And um, they've been proven to be incredibly effective in blood cancers. And I believe they're now being trying try to be employed against sort of solid tumors. However, the researchers here have utilized these same CAR T cells instead of against cancer cells, they've used them against senescent cells. So just a reminder, senescent cells are dysfunctional cells which accumulate with age that instead of being cleared by the body's immune system, they persist and excrete all of these inflammatory factors which cause all sorts of problem with problems in our bodies. And as I say, they accumulate with age and uh, uh, other studies have shown that by using chemical means, uh, once they are cleared, um, a certain amount of rejuvenation takes place in, um, in mice at least. And initially there are some initial promising studies in humans. Actually, there are quite a lot of studies taking place in humans already. So what the researchers here have done is look for a marker on the surface of senescent cells, which are mainly expressed by senescent cells, not in sort of normal tissue, engineered these T cells or CAR T cells to attack those, um, those markers on the, in the senescent cells. Now, firstly, I'm, this, this is a follow-up to some research that took play, came out in 2020, which I actually missed at that time, where they had a, a sort of proof of principle in mice and they actually um, use these cells against uh, uh, mice with lung cancers and liver fibrosis for some promising effect but the study is behind a paywall so i haven't actually been able to uh to read it however um the this uh this marker which they found was called um eurokinase plasminogen activator receptor or upar and I'll stick with UPAR. And they found that this, again, this marker, well, firstly, they looked to see if this marker was expressed by uh, senescent cells comparing between three-month-old and 20-month-old mice. And it's maybe not so incredibly visible here, but you should maybe be able to make out that um, some of the top four pictures are slices from young mice, liver, fat, muscle, and the pancreas and below are, are, are the uh, 20 month old mice. And this is staining for UPAR, this, 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 uh, this marker, and you can sort of see that there's a greater amount of staining in the bottom pictures. 
I won't go into these these things, but here's um, at the, the I, K, and M show a percentage of these sort of UCAR positive cells amongst um, as a proportion of the senescent cells in the um, in the older mice. So it seems that UPAR cells are sort of more ubiquitous in uh, senescent cells. And next, they um, wanted to see if they could, um, um, yeah, so the change, I guess part of the changes uh, with age in the uh, human pancreas, um, they had some samples from young children, zero to six or infants, I guess, and uh, older people between the age of 50 and 76. You should see here, here are all sort of different um this different portions of the uh, of the human pancreas, and the blue shows cells which don't have markers for UPAR. The red shows cells which have a marker for UPAR. And actually, we'll go I'm going to take a look at this in a clearer detail. And you should be able to see again with all each of these different cell types. The top is are the older cells. The uh, bottom are the younger cells, and you should see. There is an increase, for the most part, in these red cells, so which are indicating that not only senescent cells increase. Um, oh, you should also see on the left-hand side it's the UPAR cells. On the right-hand side, it is uh, ge um, sort of generic or general senescent cells. And by and large, there is not only an increase in the senescent cells between zero and six year, uh, between the young children and older adults. But there is also a marked increase in these UPAR cells. So it's showing that uh, UPAR just sort of does increase with age in the pancreas by quite a considerable degree. So once they had uh, found that out, they now switched to um, naturally aged mice, which were 18 to 20 months old. And uh, they injected the mice at the age of 18 months. And then they um, follow them for a couple of months and then they were euthanized and uh, tissue samples were taken. And they they um, did, I should explain, they sort of, uh, they used two different controls. One um, on the left here called UT, they just injected um, the mice with sort of benign substance. In the middle here, this catchily named H19M28Z were sort of CAR T cells that didn't have, that's the specific receptor on them, which were searching for um, for these UPAR markers. So they were testing for non-specific T cell cytotoxicity. And on the right hand side are the, um, the genetically modified cells meant to, to, to seek out these UPAR markers. And maybe it's not incredibly visual here, but compare it to the two controls on the left-hand side. And oh, also the uh, two markers are being uh, checked for SA beta gal, which is a, um, a sort of a general senescent marker. And, the, and here we've got UPAR. And compared to the sort of the two controls, hopefully you should be able to see that um, the staining is sort of there's there's fainter redness in uh, the UPAR treated cells on the uh, right hand side here. So there's just general little bit less staining showing that they and not only the UPAR cells, but also general sort of senescence. So indicating that they sort of cleared them. This is a sort of heat map showing how the inflammatory markers secreted by sen senescent cells also went down. It's, to be honest, it's not 100 percent clear. Explanation is not very good in the text, what this is exactly showing. But anyway, it's supposedly showing that uh, the inflammation markers, senescent, senescent associated inflammation markers decreased as well. Um, next, I wanted to test the safety of this. And we won't sort of go into the details because, again, the text doesn't really explain it all. But supposedly, all of these tests regarding triglyceride levels or basically safety tests, for the most part, are they in all part showed that there was no real change between the controls and the treated 
uh, the treated mice. And you can sort of tell that by looking at the p-values. So a p-value below 0 0.05 shows there's less than a 1 in 20% chance that... Um, um, that it was purely chance, and all these all these p values, as far as I can see, yes, it does appear to be all these p values are above that. So none of these safety, uh, none of these markers reached um, in terms of changes reached statistical significance, indicating that um, this treatment was safe. And secondly, well, next nextly, I guess I should say. They wanted to see what effects these had. Not that not that they were just safe, but not that they just cleared the senescent cells away, but they actually did a made a difference to the mice involved in this study. So that's what they they did. And they specifically looked at sort of metabolic functions and sort of exercise capacity. So let's go in here and take a look. And firstly, they checked uh, fasting glucose. And so in all of these, uh, the blue is the sort of the, the general control. The green is the injected with CAR T cells, but not the specific antigen marker uh, controls. And the red are the, um, uh, the mice with the UPAR killer cells. And the first test was uh, fasting blood glucose. And you can see that it is uh, lower, lower is better. Then and again, and this just makes statistical significance. And oh yeah, that one does. Um, that one does as well. So yeah, so th these results are showing a statistical significance. And B and C is showing when is, is given. Um, the mice were given a glucose tolerance test. And again, the red line is below. The red bar here is below. And uh, here's a checking testing the. Um, insulin reaction or um, insulin resistance. So before they were given the glucose, insulin levels were lower in the uh, UPAR mice, and then the, but they still had a good reaction to the, uh, um, the glucose um, test or bolus, I guess they, they, they call it in the text. And this uh, meant that, um, yeah, basically met metabolically had had a good uh, reaction and from a exercise standpoint their running duration how long they could uh, run for and uh, the maximum speed of the mice their little fast little critters increased as well and once again for at least one some of them reached statistical significance and finally, in these figures, um, these uh, charts, they showed that these cells persisted and indeed um, sort of replicated themselves. You can see here that after 20 months, the UPAR cells had increased in number, whereas for the controls, they sort of hadn't really. So they were they were sort of, in a sense, proliferating in the body, increasing in number, and hopefully increasing in effectiveness. In effectiveness as a result. Oops, let's close that. Um, next, they wanted to see how long these cells, these uh, CAR T cells, would last because in um, the, when they are used in cancer therapy, there have been very long periods of remissions where the cancer goes away and stays away. And the, the cells are, CAR T cells are actually keeping the cancers at bay. And there, there are now, instances where people have, you know, gone for more than 10 years uh, without a reoccurrence of their cancers, you know, effective cures, because after, uh, after all, in cancer, if you survive five years after your cancer, you are considered cured, even though it might come back after that. So what they did was they gave uh, these cells to young mice, to three-month-old mice, and, uh, you know, so gave them one single dose. And then they tested them 12 months later to see if the cells um, were still there and if they still had an effect. And as you can see, for A and B in the spleen and liver, the, after 12 months, the CAR T cells, uh, UPAR CAR T cells, were still there. And uh, compared to the controls, they they, they were say, sort of, I guess, proliferated still. And once again, they tested the, how this affected the metabolism of the mice and uh, see similar to the previous uh, figures C and D here are showing, or oh, firstly C is just showing the fasting blood glucose, which is uh, lower 
then D and E are showing uh, glucose tolerance tests. And once again, um, the red line, which is the UPAR cells, is lower than the other two control. And the area under the curve, showing the same thing in a different way, is also lower. And once again, in insulin, insulin levels were initially lower in the UPAR treated mice, and but how the insulin response was very was very strong, much stronger than the controls. And he, in terms of endurance, you can see here G is running duration, and once again H is maximum speed. And you can see on the right here for, for both um, they were higher than the controls. The red dots are higher um, than the blue or green ones. So not only did their metabolism improve, but their endurance or their exercise ca capacity did as well. And remember, these were young mice um, injected and 12 months later when they are middle-aged, getting getting on in life, they um, still had, this still had an effect in them. And oh, the endurance was nine months later. So they were nine months old. Supposedly after 20 months in the supplementary figures, this the the improvements sort of seem to diminish a little bit to a degree, but still, um, at least after after a considerable time, for, at least for a mouse, there was an improvement in the exercise capacity. And now in the bottom here. Uh, once again, we are seeing um, staining of the, um, I get the euthanized mice after after 12 months. They were euthanized. And uh, once again, uh, um, UT and in, on the left in the middle are the two sort of controls. On the right are the UPAR treated mice. The In the reminder, SA beta gal, general marker of senescence, and the UPAR on the right here. And... Um, you should hopefully be able to see that their the strength of the staining has gone down. Certainly, in senescent cells you can see here in the fatty adipose tissue and the liver, maybe it's slightly less so in the pancreas, but still, it uh, the staining indicates that they were still clearing um, senescent cells, or they prevented the senescent cells from accumulating in the first place. And finally. What uh, since they've been testing uh, metabolism for the most part here, they also wanted to see whether or not uh, these UPAR CAR T cells could treat or prevent metabolic syndrome arising in the well, treat treat it or prevent it uh, from arising in the first place. And what they did here was that they fed mice a high fat diet for two months and then they injected them with the cells. And here they just used uh, one control, the sort of the general the general control. And what they found was that one month later after they had injected the cells, or is it 20 days later? Let's call it one month late. 20 days later, so three weeks later, they found that the body weight had reduced. So obviously high fat diet means that the mice get fatter and heavier. So the body weight was reduced and uh, the fasting glucose was also reduced like the previous studies and the in the glucose tolerance test once again the red line is below the blue line, blue line and the area under the curve which is again showing the same thing is pretty much being uh, reduced and f and g show when they were injected with insulin uh, once again the gl glucose levels were uh, lower so the insulin worked better in the area under the curve and Two months later, two and a half months later, they did the repeated the glucose tolerance test. And once again, the red lines are below the blue lines, as was the um, area under the curve. And finally, the final experiment they did on, in this paper was they wanted to see if the CAR T cells could uh, prevent uh, problems with a high fat diet. So they injected the um, CAR T cells and then only one and a half months later, did they put the mice on a high fat diet? These were again, were younger than mice, I believe three months old to start with. And then um, a month after that, they tested the, the body weight. And yet again, you can see the red dots are below the blue dots. The body weight was reduced or didn't increase as much um, compared to the untreated mice. And once again, the fasting glucose 
was lower and the glucose tolerance test was lower. The red line is under the blue. The red bar is lower than the uh, blue bar. And then again, once a month later, two months later, they tested it again and the same, the same thing resulted. So basically that even if, if they uh, were injected before on a high fat diet or in the middle of the high fat diet, the CAR T cells prevented um, or lessened the effects of uh, the high fat diet. So all in all, a very promising study. Now, um, a couple of th other things to mention is that this was not actually the very the first time CAR T cells have been used against senescent cells. In uh, June of last year, a paper came out, which you could find in my, sorry, in August of last year, a paper came out, which you can find in my August review, though um, last August it was behind a paywall, and now it's actually available. So if you... Find my August longevity review and look in the senescence section. You can find this other paper, which is now open for everyone to read, in which uh, another receptor called NKG2DL, catchy name, was you know, a, a, that's a marker on the cell. So they um, engineered the CAR T cells to go after that. And they also, interestingly enough, in that paper, tried to uh, test out the safety of those cells in a non-human primate, a rhesus macaque, um, obviously much closer to us than mice. And it seemed to reduce senescent cells in those monkeys. So the significance is, is that there's more than one marker. There's more than one group of scientists working towards this. And... The, the thing that stood out in this paper, um, they used they, they they were looking at different markers than or, or different uh, phenotypical markers than than the other paper. Here they were looking very much at metabolism, but the big thing here is the fact that the, is the fact that they were looking at the persistence of these cells. The fact that they could do a single injection and the effect would last over a considerable period of time, especially for a mouse, you know, over 12 months. Also, they could be given to younger mice and it would prevent the deleterious effects of senescent cells from emerging in the first place. And also they seem to be quite effective against metabolic syndrome, which is very prevalent in Western societies. So... Well, I guess in the world as well these days. So all in all, a very promising approach and look forward to uh, future studies. Oh, one last thing is that they are now conducting lifespan experiments using um, this, uh, this method. So we'll see whether or not it also increases mouse lifespan in due course. Moving to the next paper. In this study, Korean researchers found a new way to extend mouse lifespan by activating TLR5. Now, TLR5 stands for toll-like receptor 5, which is a receptor of the immune system which recognizes pathogens, specifically the flagella of bacteria. Now, the flagella are these sort of the whip-like appendages which bacteria use to propel themselves. And... So it recognizes them and activates the innate immune system. Now, these researchers a few years ago were investigating this uh, receptor to see if it could help improve the immune response to vaccinations in the elderly. And when they tested it out for, for uh, streptococcal bacteria in mice, um, it was effective uh, against um, against that uh, bacterial strain. However, they also noticed that it seemed to improve various uh, aging phenotypes of the aged mice that they were using. And they decided to investigate that further. And they came up with some quite interesting results, which we will now take a look at. Beforehand, just briefly mention that they um, employed a fusion, uh, they called an FP fusion protein, um, but, uh, using a flagella from a bacteria as well as a pneumonocal surface protein A, so they called it FP, and they sort of not didn't inject it, they sort of um, gave it to mice via their, their nasal cavities where these TLR5 
uh, receptors are located, and they're also also lo located uh, quite often in our intestines to, to, to protect us against bacteria via that route. But let's take a look at what they found out. And opening up the first image here. So firstly, they, they tested this out on 650 day old mice, roughly 21 months old. And as you can see on these two survival curves, uh, on the left is female, on the right is male. It extended both the median and the maximum lifespan of both sexes. And for the men, it uh, extended a median lifespan by 8% and maximum lifespan by a rough 10.7%. Uh, for females, it was an even better result with 11.9% um, 11 um, 11 uh, improvement in median lifespan and a 17% improvement in maximum lifespan. And you can see that they use 25 or 26 mice in each group. And uh, the p-values um, looking good. They're under 0 0.05, which means means they reach statistical significance. And the researchers um, also say that they believe that this was the uh, 650 days initiation. This was the latest start of any successful longevity treatment that, that actually successfully lengthened the lifespan of a mouse. Now, I'll take them at their at their word. Now, again, it wasn't a huge amount of mice, but still uh, 25 in each or 26 in each group is not, it's not a tiny number. And, uh, but it wasn't just the lifespan, which improved. Obviously that's maybe the main goal. Uh, very, various other phenotypes also improved. Now, if you look here first at C after 25 months on the left is uh, the control mice on the right is the uh, TLR5 activated mouse and you can see that well it's its hair color has been maintained and it doesn't seem to be thinning as it appears to be in uh, the control mouse not only that but the bone density and so here underneath those pictures you can see the score of hair status so i guess lower is better and uh, bone density improved as well slightly better in uh more similar to the young mice than the um than the old control mice in the middle here of D, and the tube area again. This is to do with um bone mass was quite a bit better. You got the young ma mice on the left, old control mice in the middle, and uh, the treated mice, FB treated mice on the right, and their tube area of bones uh was uh, improved compared to the the controls. And uh, the weight of the thymus, which is where uh, sort of T cells are sort of born, or, um, crucial cells in our bodies. If you remember the previous study, CAR T cells, where they, where they get created, naturally that is. The weight of the thymus was higher because one of the issues with aging is that the thymus involutes is get, get smaller, sort of atrophies and um, produces less sort of immune cells. And oh yeah, it didn't. Although it didn't approach the level of the young mice, there was still an improvement over the um, the untreated controls. But one issue the thymus has in humans is that it sort of it actually um, doesn't so much shrink as it gets a lot more fatty and produces less immune cells. So the fact that it's not shrunk as much is maybe a good thing, but more importantly, in the number of thymocytes, so what, what gets produced in the thymus, definitely uh, improved in the treated mice, and which resulted in a greater number of naive T cells in splenocytes, so in, the, in the spleen. So naive T cells uh, are important because that means they haven't um, yet uh, encountered a, a novel pathogen. So um, we need naive T cells when we when we do encounter uh, new pathogens, uh, bacteria and su such like. So it's important to have more naive ones. And there was definite improvement there, even though it didn't quite didn't didn't reach that of a youthful level. Next, they looked at the glucose uptake in the brain. And I guess a sort of a heat chart. Um, you can see if the colors here, uh, dark blue or black, going all the way up to orangey white. And uh, again, young on the left, control in the middle, 
treated mice on the right, and they had greater uptake of glucose in the brain, which can be seen on this bar chart here on the right. So we need to approach that of the young mice again, which is a good thing. Our brains for in ketosis uh, require lots of glucose and... Perhaps most importantly, the um, sort of physiological aspects improved as well. So the, uh, Jay here shows how far the mice were able to run, I guess, on a treadmill. And once again, there was a marked improvement over the control mice. Nest score here under K means, I guess, the how organized or how night like mice make sort of little nests, uh, not to lay eggs, but uh, to sleep in and... Um, uh, I've seen pictures before of sort of older mice's nests. They're they're a lot lot more disorganized and stuff. So I guess there's a nest nest score, and there was an improvement compared to the controls. Again, not not close to the young mice, but still an improvement. And uh, here um, L is preference score. So um, this is how much the mice were able to notice novel objects or like, they didn't detail exactly how they carried out this experiment, but the preference test was much better in the uh, treated mice. And the M here is, uh, pass is a passive avoidance task. Again, didn't explain exactly what that was, but the results were much better in the treated mice compared to the control. So uh, quite impressive results so far considering that they, all that they were doing was um activating this uh this immune receptor in the um in the nose of the mice next the researchers wanted to take a look at how they would the mice would respond to an sort of a inflammatory insult when they were given bleomycin and how that would affect their lungs or fibrosis in the lungs scarring of the lungs basically and bleomycin is a cancer drug actually but it has toxicities related to the lungs that's why it got used here and once again well not once again on the left is uh the sort of the control placebo on the in the middle are the they're just given the, this sort of this toxin bleomycin toxin and then the treated animals on the right and this staining shows collagen deposition which ha um, occurs with uh, fibrosis and uh, this may be hard to make out but there's less staining in the treated mice and here hydroxyproline is a uh, in B here, hydroxyproline is one of the constituents of collagen, so which is what, what's, what gets deposited. And you can see here, looking at the control, uh, sort of the uh, untreated mice and the treated mice, uh, much less uh, collagen deposition in the treated mice. Not only that, but they also lived, um, let, less of them died. You can see in the survival chart here, uh, red line being the treated mice, the blue line, being the untreated mice, black line being the mice that weren't given the bleomycin, and a lot more uh, survived. And it's also passed the statistical significance test. In addition, uh, markers, sort of inflammatory markers, TNF-alpha, IL-6, were lower, much lower um, in the treated mice, approaching that of the control, and some other markers of these two are uh, markers of uh, i guess inflammation on the right more collagen uh markers and again in each case they were uh closer or the same as um the control mice so it uh the mice responded uh, much better uh to uh this toxicity the toxicity of bleomycin when they were given um this uh, act TLR5 activator before, and I believe they were given it like a day before or so. And they wanted next to check whether um, whether or not this was being caused actually by a TLR5 activation. So the researchers produced sort of TLR5 knockout mice uh, or TLR5 mutant mice. They called them mute here. And you can see here, explaining how the details of what they changed to, to do it uh, in A. In B, showing the activity of, again, NFKB, inflammatory 
agent and uh anyway they basically discovered in these experiments that um it was it seemed the act the tlr5 activator it, well, it was basically the tlr5 that um is was necessary for the beneficial effects of this activator to work and you can see on the survival curves here uh the control and these uh mutant mice had exactly the same pretty uh, survival curve only the whereas the treated mice with um which had the tlr5 receptor had once again extended survival uh curve here now the one th thing extra to point out um this was shown in some supplementary material but they also tested for cataracts and um the sort of fp treated mice had much fewer cataracts than either the control mice or these uh, TLR5 mutant mice. And once again, with the hair color like before, uh, only the uh, the mice with TLR5 who were given the activator had uh, maintained their, their color coating of their, their hair. And then they also wanted to see um, what its effects would be on the intestine, because as I mentioned before, these receptors are quite often uh, are, are highly prevalent in the intestine. And, uh, but again, they didn't, uh, they still um, administered it via the, the nose, the nasal cavity, cavity. And firstly, they also wanted to check uh, whether or not the effects of this activator could actually be due to mice eating less because that's one issue with a lot of lifespan studies is that um i mean the gold standard in a sense or the the, the first proven way to extend the life, lifespan is calorific restriction uh, which has a, quite a pronounced effect in mice and in some experiments the reason why mice live longer is not because of what what was the given to the mice and usually in their food but the fact that what was given to mice was not pal palatable to the mice so they ate less and in a sense any benefit was because of calorific restriction not because of what was the drug that was given to the mice so here they show uh, food intake between the control and the treated mice and as you can actually see the treated mice actually ate more than the control but on the right here the body weight stayed the same so it this was not as a result of calorific restriction but moving on to the intestine i'm sure you can't wait here are some slices of the intestine the of the, of the villi the sort of finger-like projections on the side of the intestine which absorbed the nutrients and you get young on the left old controls in the middle and the treated mice on the right and i'm not i'm no villi expert but supposedly and i guess you can kind of see it that um, they uh the old treated mice there really resembled more that of the young than the old control mice not only that but the some two senescent markers p16 and p53 were much lower in the treated mice than in the controls and were closer or similar to that of the younger um, younger mice. And on the left here, showing that the, um, the reaction, so to speak, um, the immune reaction, double checking in this, yeah, an increased response over time, because I didn't mention it before, but they actually gave this activator eight times over the course of a couple months. And Here's the it's dark, the black dots are the treated mice and um, it increased with the number of the reaction, um, the response re increased with the number of administrations. And on the right here, something you were not expecting to see when you turned this video on, but this is a picture of a, pro a prolapsed anus of a mouse and uh, supposedly my, um, with colitis or colitis, uh, your anus can prolapse, especially if you're a mouse. And there was the, there was less. This happened less often in the treated mice than in the in the control mice, according to the bar bar graph on the right hand side. Hopefully, you weren't eating anything. Moving swiftly on, 
finally ending here with um, just looking at a TLR5 expression in the intestine. And you can see that in the GNH and it imp increased compared to control in both cases. And also there was increase in IL-22, which is an anti-inflammatory protein marker, call it what you will. So that improved as well. So all in all, some pretty impressive results. And in addition, I can also say that in the supplementary material, material, which we won't go into, they also had reduced expression of an inflammatory marker, IL-6, in the liver, kidney, spleen, and colon, and also senescent markers were decreased in the, once again, P16 and P53 in the lung, liver, and kidney. So quite interesting, quite interesting results here because um, something I've not heard, heard about this method before, that simply activating an immune receptor in the nose can have such profound body-wide effects. Now, the researchers say that this is just sort of the beginnings of the research into this. A lot more research is needed, but I would say this is quite promising, quite very, very interesting as this opens up a completely new avenue and um, and might show the importance of the immune system for our longev our health and our longevity. So it was a bit of a surprise, much in the way it was a, quite a bit of a surprise around 15 years ago or so when it was discovered how important the immune system is to treating cancer and all the immunotherapies which have come out subsequently, which are having such a profound impact on tra cancer treatment. Maybe the same will happen when it comes to our, our health in old age and our overall longevity. Continuing to the next paper, I have a number of friends, especially male friends, who'd be very interested in this study, especially if they have male pattern baldness, because this deals in sort of the basic science as to what causes hair to grow or hair to sort of shift in, the, in its hair cycle. And we will uh, quickly go down to the graphical abstract so I can explain a little bit better. But um, our hair grows in cycles. It goes from a telogen to anagen to catagen phases. And the different phases are telogen is when the hair is sort of sleeping. Anagen is when it is growing. And catagen is when it's sort of shifting back into sleeping mode. Now, this cycle lasts for months and years, and it is continuously occurring. Now, for people unfortunate to have issues with their hair falling out or issues with male pattern baldness or just baldness in, in, in general, what tends to happen is that um, the antigen phase sort of doesn't start. The telogen phase just sort of continues. The hair ends up just, well, shriveling away or unfortunately falling out. Now, this study was a study into basic research, um, basically. And the authors were trying to find, figure out whether or not autophagy, which is the sort of cellular recycling, so self-eating from the Greek, could be a crucial component in shifting the cell, um, the hair follicle phase from telogen to anagen. And uh, they um, they employed an uh, autophagy activator and an autophagy inhibitor on uh, mice to test this theory out. Now I'm not an expert in this. So I don't know if this is a well known well known theory or not. But um, anyway, this this um, research caught my eye, not so much because of the basic science behind it, but because of the activator which they used, which was my favorite geoprotective molecule, rapamycin, which I've talked about at length in the past. And as I say, I believe it's the closest to prime time. So without further ado, actually, we'll just explain a little bit more here. But Basically, what, what the researchers were, were surmising was, was that during the telogen to antigen uh, transition, which is so the transition from the resting to the growing phase, involved uh, up the upregulation of autophagy. 
And so that's why they uh, used rapamycin, which is an autophagy activator in this study. So let's take a look at the results. So firstly, they just looked at markers of autophagy in, um, in sort of normal mice given given uh, not, nothing but in, in the different stages. So early telogen, mid to late telogen, telogen to antigen transition and early antigen. So telogen antigen, that's the sort of the sort of the important switching phase. And uh, they used a marker called LC3B, which is uh, yeah, a marker of autophagy and it appears to be strongest or stronger during this transition phase. Another marker they checked called P62 declines during autophagy and once again, during the um, intelligent antigen transition, the, the brightness level of this uh, marker here when it was stained, uh, decreased, or I guess it's a fluorescent mark. I'm not sure exactly. And you can see here on the uh, bar bar charts as well that for um, this LC3B, it really levels really increased during the telogen antigen phase, and PCC2 declined during that phase. Now, okay, that's what happens. Sort of a normal mouse hair. What happens when they when they um, employed this activator and uh, inhibitor. So in these pictures, you have the control regular mice on the left, both for A and B, the inhibitor called 3MA in the middle and rapamycin, term rapa here, on the right-hand side. And in the left, uh, nine squares all about LC3B, so better is more. And on the right is P62, which less is 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 better. And as you can see, I guess the bottom, the bottom line of squares for rapamycin, there was a much greater brightness of, of, of the staining, certainly compared to the, the inhibitor and even more so than the controls. Likewise, with the um, P62 marker, it was much lower for rapamycin than either the controls or 3MA, at least for the visual eye test. And in terms of better quantification here, the LC3B dots is, again, more is better, much, much, much higher that in rapamycin than in the controls and p62 was lower in the in rapamycin compared to the controls and yes this was in the telogen antigen transitionary phase and if you rem remember from the previous set of figures or previous images as well at the at this phase the levels of this lc3b went up and p62 went down anyway but it's an interesting oops interesting to see how how mu how much greater uh, the effect was with rapamycin here when they looked on so one thing they did was they they shaved the mice of shaved the hair off the back of some mice and watched how the hair regrew and the, so the color came back when they used just the inhibitor um, the pigmentation score was much lower than in the control so the bottom line is just 3ma on its own you can see pictures here of the of i guess i guess this, assume the same mouse they look different size here but i guess i'm assuming it's the same mouse and uh, the inhibitor of autophagy the hair regrowth was less now who cares about the inhibitor? What about rapamycin? Well, you can see here in G, according to the pigmentation score, rapamycin is a triangle, maybe a bit harder to see, but it is the top line and the pigmentation score shot up much more than the control and certainly much more than the inhibitor. But considering the fact none of us are going to be putting on this inhibitor on our hair, on our heads, the fact that Rapamycin produced much better pigmentation is, is important. And also the hair covered area was higher. Once again, rapamycin with the sort of triangle, it's a bit hard to see, but that's the top line here, did, of course, much, much better than the inhibitor, but 
more importantly, much better than the uh, control mice. Now, it's very nice to see this on a graph, but you're, I'm sure you're screaming, show me the pictures. And let's, let's take a look. So here are the top line control, the inhibitor in the middle and rapamycin in the bottom over the course of 11 days. And I wish they'd, you know, maybe had bigger pictures, make clearer pictures, but you can see that, uh, I guess comparing rapamycin to the control, then after certainly after seven days, and even at, at, at 11 days, there seemed to be more hair regrowth comparing rapamycin to the controls. So, man, looks good stuff. And on the right here is a cross section, and it's not quite clear to me, but supposedly this is showing also that rapamycin showed more growth or better better results. Maybe the darker hair follicle staining there indicates that the text wasn't completely clear. They also checked, uh, they also stained for something called KI67, which is a, a, cell, a cell known for proliferation to help st stem cells to proliferate or marker of that. And once again, it was higher in the rapamycin, both on the visual eye test in the middle and on the right-hand side. So the number of KI67 positive cells was much higher in rap, uh, the rapamycin treated hair follicles than the control or the inhibitor. Now, this is all good and well in mice. However, what about humans? Now, they didn't test this in living, breathing humans. However, they did test it in human hair follicles. It's grown in culture, grown up um, in vitro, so to speak. And let's take a look what happened there. So starting off once again with this LCB, LC3B marker of autophagy and the you know, P62, once again, uh, more LC3B is better, less P62 is better as well. And I guess looking at the um, the bottom line here, rapamycin uh, produced more of this marker for autophagy and less of this other uh, negative markers, certainly compared to the inhibitor, it looks, the eyeball test looks kind of the same as control, but according to the bar, bar charts, the LC3B are massively increased in rapamycin compared to controls, and also the PCs2 levels were massively decreased in uh, the rapamycin-treated human hair follicles. E is showing the elongation percentage. I guess I'm, how far the, the the hair cells grew in culture um, after seven days. And once again, zoom in here a bit. Uh, the rapamycin is the little triangle. And once again, that is the top line. So the rapamycin had greater hair elongation, greater growth. And they took the uh, took the hair follicles from three different donors. I looked at the quant, uh, the um, percentage of hair follicles in each hair cycle stage, and the three stages: antigen growth, dark uh, dark gray is early cat catagen. Uh, so that when it's when it's stopping growing, and uh, the sort of lighter one is mid to late catagen. Again, it's sort of having stopped growing, I guess. And once again, so three different donors and control inhibitor and rapamycin on the right in that order. And for each of the three donors, when rapamycin was added, you can clearly see a much greater uh, percentage of cells or uh, cells, hair follicles even were in the antigen stage. So in the growing phase and more visual indication um here we've got control again inhibitor rapamycin on the right and not sure they're, they're sort of bent there but if you, just, if you can see there it's, it seems to be clear that the uh, length of the rapamycin hair follicles um was greater than the control i wish they had which had them a bit straighter to make it the comparison a bit better but uh i don't know does rapamycin straighten your hair as well don't know. And once again, they looked at KI67 cells. 
And I mean, it's hard to sort of tell from these, these images, but according to the bar chart on the right, rapamycin had a much higher percentage of Ki67 positive cells in uh, yeah, these hum human hair follicles. And just once again, just a few more images showing a, sim a similar a similar thing, different, I guess after 12, how many hours after the treatment occurred and uh, showing that, yeah, K15 or whatever increased rapidly, more rapidly in, rapami in the rapamycin treated human hair follicles. Now, the rest of the article is all about um, delving more into the basic biology of all this and how, how does this all sort of occur and cutting along, we won't sort of delve into it too much, but um, basically cut a long story short. Oops. You can take, you can take a look at it, take a look at it in your own time, but Long story short, autophagy activates the human follicle stem cells by upregulating something called, uh, where is it gone? LDHA, which is, you see LDHA mentioned quite a few times, which promotes the shift of the human follicle stem cells metabolism towards glycolysis. So the use of glucose and thereby regulating the hair follicle cycle and promoting hair growth. So I'm going to, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're really keen to see the, the rest of this basic biology, do take a look, but it just goes into much detail. Um, and again, just proving that Ralph Meissen grows hair on, uh, on, grows more hair on the back of the mice. And when this LD8, HA is knocked out, rapamycin doesn't do that. Now, in the discussion, the authors simply just continues, continuously talk about the basic biology. There's no sort of mention of any, uh, there's no mention of any translational potential, but that is screaming out that this appears to be a quite readily available test to be done. And hopefully some researchers out there might, or even some self-experimenters perhaps might test this out because the rapamycin i believe was put into a cream and just you know rubbed on the mice or what have you or injected into the mice so it strikes me that this could be easily tested and certainly for the large number of people out there who really care about maintaining a good head of hair this strikes me as being um something that should be investigated uh, investigated more promptly. And finally, on to the Canadian research highlight. Okay, firstly, full disclosure. The researchers who conceived the study and the primary authors of this study came from the Netherlands. However, there were four Canadian researchers from the University of Ottawa involved, so that's why it's being included. Secondly, it became available in December, as you can see there when it's published. However, it's coming out, and it came out in a January issue of iScience. So um, that's why I'm including it for January. Anyway, disclosure out of the way, this was still a, an interesting study. And in this study, researchers were looking at uh, trying to find novel compounds which could be used to treat aging related diseases. And they started off by doing an in silico uh, screen so in in computers looking using a ge genetic database of known uh, longevity genes as well as a library of chemical uh, molecules in fact they screened over 4000 uh, over sorry over 2000 2837 molecules against 25 different um, longevity genes and you can see those 25 longevity genes at the at the top there and they came up with 498 different hits or at least 498 different molecules which had at least one hit against these 25 different genetic pathways and you can sort of see the top rated molecules here in this chart um, going from least number of hits at the bottom to the most at the top and the molecule with the most hits, um, 12 out of 25, was something called compound 
60 or Merck 60, which I guess, I guess it was, came from a Merck, uh, that's a drug company um, database. I will call it C60 from now on. And it ha even had more hits. If you look closely, you can see Sirolimus, uh, better known as rapamycin, had uh, 10 out of 25 hits on this screen. So they took the lead compound, C60, and they subjected it to more tests. And they started off by looking at renal fibrosis. I should mention this, that the C60 was or is a HDAC1-2 inhibitor, which are in use for as a cancer treatment, in case you're wondering, though I don't really know too much more about it. But they first um, took a look as to its effects on kidneys, and they injected it into, or gave it to, 20-month-old uh, mice, as you can see in B here, and they gave it to them for 14 days at 22.5 milligrams per kilogram, I guess, of body weight. And they first checked to see if there were, um, so yeah, after 14 days, the little mice, unfortunately, had to sacrifice themselves for science. And first, what they checked was just changes sort of in terms of gene, gene expression or, I guess, methylation markers. And they noticed um, that compound 60 had more changes than the vehicle control showing that it may seem to do a difference of some sort to the kidney and when they looked at what that difference might be they found out that the most impact the gene pathways most impacted had to deal with the glutathione metabolic process now glutathione is one of the our body's uh, primary antioxidants and uh, generally having more of it is a good thing it's used for detoxification various other things but yeah generally speaking more glutathione is better and uh, when so that's also a good thing but also looking at the the physical effects of it and in terms of uh, kidney fibrosis looking at when, when they sort of sliced uh, the kidneys open and stained them for fibrotic uh, collagen deposition. You can see here in these two pictures, control on the left, the compound 60 on the right, there was less collagen deposited than in the control. And according to this bar chart, a bar graph on the right here, so for interstitial fibrosis, it was also lower. So beneficial effects were seen in the kidney using by using this compound. Next, they uh, tested it out on the brain. And once again, there were differences in expression or methylation patterns. Histone methylation are showing that it was having some sort of effect. And looking at what things it might be affecting, and obviously numerous things were affected, but of interesting note in terms of the brain was that various pathways associated with Alzheimer's disease were affected. And they were importantly sort of down-regulated. So in this graph here, various genes associated, I guess, with Alzheimer's or in some way, the uh, gray bars are as a control, blue is uh, the treated um, the treated mice, and yeah, the various Alzheimer's-associated pathways were sort of reduced, down-regulated by this compound. Not only that, they also... Um, looked at um, other genetic pathways associated with cognition. And yeah, this is a quite sort of dense graph here. So these are an, more genetic pathways, but associated with better, benef uh, better cognition. So beneficial effects. And they found that there was upregulation in the G in genes, which benefited cognition. Now, they didn't do any cognitive tests, at least so far, but at least from a genetic standpoint, things seem to trend in the correct or the better direction uh, in current terms of genetic pathways in the brain. Following that, they then took a look at the heart. And although they didn't initially find any changes in histone acetylation in the heart, uh, looking at transcriptional changes, they saw that there were changes related to heart valve development. You can see at the top here was the, the, the greatest change. And various 
genes expressing associated again with heart valve development increase again in in, in this uh, chart here graph here gray is the control blue is treated animals and it increased for for all of these specific specific genes now they test they then tested this compound in in vitro so in a test tube where they 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 put some um, heart cells into it and yeah cardiomyocytes and they tested their contraction and their relaxation and you can see here in these two bar graphs on the left is sarcomere shortening and the right is return velocity and which basically means that on the left is how well the cells can contract and on the right is showing how well they can relax basically so better contraction better relaxation is a good thing and in both instances according to these two bar graphs here compound 60 did better than the sort of placebo the vehicle control the mso sort of something often used as um as a control so again beneficial potentially beneficial effects on the heart as well so they next looked at it more sort of globally this compound and saw that 41 genes were upregulated, 30 genes were downregulated, and the HIF1A genes, which supposedly increase oxidative stress resistance, were sort of a focal point of these changes. And a summary here showing the tissue-specific transcriptional effects, so kidney detoxification, improved brain cognition, heart development, which led to less kidney fibrosis or recapping your less partial epithelial mesenchymal transition that's sort of a, a bad thing we something we don't want to happen in us and lower dementia gene expression as i said cardiomyocytes contraction and relaxation improved and the transcriptional effects as i say um, oxidative stress alteration in a beneficial way using hif one a that's how you pronounce it. Now, these were this study was still very much the beginning stages. That's a, sort of as far as they got. Graphical abstract here, uh, summarizing the what they found. I mean, these are very early days for uh, this compound. Hopefully, the researchers are continuing to conduct experiments. Hopefully, they're conducting a lifespan experiment on uh, in mice on this compound and testing various other issue, uh, tissues and rather than just looking at gene and transcriptional changes actually looking at the functional changes in the mouse now one thing the researchers do say is because they only gave this compound for 14 days to the mice the changes seen compared to controls imply that uh, rather than just sort of slowing down aging because it was over such a short period of time there was actually a reversal according to uh, the results found here. So it's promising, very interesting, but uh, still early days and hopefully more research is being conducted as we speak and there will be a forthcoming paper, you know, fingers crossed, maybe showing some uh, more effects in different organs and also hopefully lifespan extension, but still good to see. And that marks the end of January's longevity review. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe for more videos, and if you also want to help the CLA achieve its mission, then please give us a donation using a link below. Other than that, see you next month. Bye.